Okay, uh, now if you take a look, uh, we've got pretty much all the information we need, except we're still missing how the calculator figured out the T star. Uh, now it did it underneath the hood, so it, we don't get to see how it generated it, but I do want to take a second and kind of point out how that was done. Uh, so if we go to distributions and look for in, um, inverse T, Okay, inverse T, they're going to ask us for area and degrees of freedom. So we want to think for a second, uh, if we're looking at the middle 95%, uh, that means you've got 5% for each of the tails. So what percent would be below the upper tail? So if you got 2.5 on each tail, 95 in the middle. So the area underneath this particular curve would be 0.975 and the degrees of freedom would be that lovely uh, 21.53 that they had in earlier. And then we just hit enter from there. Uh, so that's what it should look like for those that don't have the fancy calculator. Uh, just inverse T 0.975 comma 21.53 and then we hit enter and it's going to give us uh, 2.076 or 2.08, which is what matched the T star from the uh, slide, which we'll get back to in a second. Okay, so uh, anyway, so here's right back to where we left off. Uh, here's how we so we wrote down the formula based on what the calculator gave us, uh, and we actually kind of worked backwards to figure out some of these numbers. Uh, and then from here, let's see, uh, round the nearest uh, decimal. Okay, anyways. Uh, so now that we've got our confidence interval being from negative 5.68 to 8.085, now we have to make a sentence about what that represents. So that's that memorized sentence that we've talked about in class. We are 95% confident that the true difference in mean lengths of time required for bodily absorption is between uh, of each brand is between negative 5.6 uh, minutes and 8.085 minutes. Okay, so quick question. Uh, is there a difference between the medicines? So I have to think for a second. Uh, if we, So we ended up calculating the average time and then subtracting them. Um, if there is no difference, what number should be in the interval? And that would be zero. So if we look at uh, the negative 5.6 to the positive 8, is zero in that interval, uh, and it is, so that means statistically, as far as we can tell, the medicines are the, basically the same, that there's really no difference between one or the other. And the reason why we actually get different numbers could just be to sampling, um, just randomness in a sample. OK. Uh, just kind of tie back in some, some previous concepts that have been uh, mentioned. Uh, we have matched pairs, uh, which is a dependent two-sample test, which they call the mean difference. And this is a two-sample independent mean test, which is called the difference of means. Uh, very similar sounding, uh, and the only difference meaning uh, whether they're dependent or independent. Uh, just kind of remind us on a matched pairs test, uh, that's where we take the two lists, list one and list two. We subtract them to make a third list, and then we treat that third row of numbers as a uh, one-sample T inference process. Uh, and then this two sample process, we treat them as independent of each other and uh, we calculate using the formulas that we're given. Okay, so let's transition into hypothesis statement then. Uh, how do we actually uh, generate a p value to decide if there really is a difference between the two statements other than looking for zero in the confidence interval? Uh, well, our null hypothesis is that uh, either the difference between them is zero or that the the mu of 1 is equal to mu of 2. Uh, and then we can go back through all three uh, flavors of the alternative and just kind of make sure that we sort of capture that. So I could say the difference is less than 0, their difference is negative, or I could just say that the mean of the first is less than the mean of the second. Uh, I could do the same thing with uh, greater than, so the difference is positive, or the mean of the first is greater than the mean of the second. Uh, and then lastly, I could say that uh, on a two-tailed test, that the difference of the means is not equal to zero, or just that mean one is, is not equal to mean two. 
uh, and then when we're setting up our hypothesis statement, we still want it to define what the mu1 and mu2 represent. So in context, what does the mean of the first sample and what does the mean of the second sample really mean? Okay? Uh, and all of those statements are sort of interchangeable, whether we subtract the difference or just come out and say that uh, mu1 is equal to mu2. Um, both forms are acceptable. All right, so how do we calculate our test statistic? Well, uh, this is a T process, so we're going to use a T score. Uh, so our statistic for the standard deviation um, kind of looks like this. So we've got uh, x, x bar 1 minus x bar 2 minus mu 1 minus mu 2. So observed minus expected, and then divided by the standard deviation of the sample, which is that standard error we looked at earlier. Uh, just word of note, uh, in a two-sample inference process, we're usually assuming that mu1 is equal to mu2. So that whole term, we can usually cross out because it happens to equal zero. Okay, so uh, going back to our medicine example, uh, is there sufficient evidence that the drugs differ in the speed at which they enter the bloodstream? Okay, so we'll quickly jump through our assumptions, uh, which we've kind of already addressed with the confidence level, um, those sets of assumptions are the same. Uh, then we're going to set up our hypothesis statement uh, where we're going to, our null is that the, the means are the same and looking in the problem there really isn't sort of an indication of directionality so we'll, we'll at least state that they're not equal to each other. We'll at least try a two-tell test. And then we want to define uh, what mu a and mu b mean. So the mu a is the true mean absorption time of brand A, and the mu b is the true mean absorption time of brand B. Uh, then we want to go through and do our formulas and calculations, uh, and that's just evaluating the numbers in that lovely set of formulas we saw earlier. Uh, and I'll pull out the calculator and kind of show you how to do this in a moment. Um, but now that we're here, uh, let's talk about what that p-value says. So if we're going with the most common alpha of 0.05, uh, what does that p-value tell us about the, the difference of means? And if I don't get too excited about data unless it's less than 0.05, I've got a p-value of 0.72. It means it's pretty boring and ordinary. Uh, this, this particular type of data would show up 72% of the time. That's nothing to get excited about. Um, so in formal speak, our conclusion would be, since p-value is greater than alpha, I fail to reject the null. There is not sufficient evidence to suggest that these drugs differ in the speed in which they enter the bloodstream. Okay. All right. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, let's take out our calculators and let me kind of go back to this formula and let's work out uh, where we got the p-value uh, from to begin with. Okay, so uh, I want to show you how we actually use the calculator to get that p-value, uh, given all that lovely information up there. Uh, so go ahead and turn your calculator on, and let's go to stat, and let's arrow over to tests. Uh, we want to do a two-sample t-test. Okay, now uh, the two-sample t-test, um, because I just did a confidence interval in here, that's where all, why all my numbers are in there. Uh, but we would input the mean and standard deviation and sample size for each um, sample. So 20.1, 8.7, 12 for the first sample, and then 18.9, 7.5, and 12 for the second. Uh, and then I just pick which variety of the alternative I want. So in this case, I want a not equal to. Uh, make sure I click no for pooled, uh, and then hit calculate. And when I do that, uh, it will generate uh, the t-score, so that 0.361. It'll give me the p-value, uh, and then it'll also give me the degrees of freedom that I can uh, use for further calculations if I need to. So that's kind of nice. Okay, so let's say um, either we made an error in our calculations um, 
or we redid brand B and came back and found something out. Um, so let's say we actually change uh, brand B's mean time to 16.5, but we keep everything else the same. Uh, does that in fact uh, make a difference? Does that mean brand B is in fact better? Okay, so the nice thing is we're going to go right back to our calculator and we're just going to update uh, the mean for brand B to 16.5. Okay, and this actually was the same screen I had up a second ago. So I'm going to go to stat, uh, arrow over to tests, go down to the two sample t test, which on mine is number four. Uh, and then we said we're going to switch the mean of brand B from 18.9 to 16.5 and see if that actually makes a difference in the rest of the calculations. So I can just arrow down or just uh, hit calculate at that point. And I in fact uh, get a larger t-score and a smaller p-value. So now it shows up 28 percent of the time, um, but that's not something to get too excited about. Okay, so even though um, it's changing the time to 16.5. Uh, the sample got rare or uh, it's not less than 0.05, so it's still not something that I would consider to be statistically significant. So our conclusion would still be the same, that we would still uh, fail to reject the null. And as far as we can tell, the medicines uh, give the same relief. It's the same, uh, statistically, it's the same uh, improvement on your health, uh, whichever medicine you go with. All right, uh, let's talk about robustness for a second. Uh, let's see, uh, in two sample procedures, uh, typically are considered to be more robust than one sample procedures. Um, robust, again, means uh, resistant to extreme data or outlier data. Uh, so a two sam sample process um, would tend to give you a more representative p-value than, say, a one sample process would. Um, it's best if we're trying to show robustness that we have equal sample sizes, but for a two sample independent process it's not necessary uh, and that's kind of the, the dead giveaway that we're dealing with two independent samples is that the, the sample sizes actually aren't the same. Okay, so let's look at uh, one more example. Uh, this time let's uh, look at just raw data and we'll kind of go through how the calculator does this. Uh, so companies come up with a new uh, way to process film uh, in a manner that as soon as you take the picture it uh, starts developing it. Uh, the, the problem is the modification is expensive and if they use it uh, it would increase the cost significantly so what they want to investigate is uh, is there really a significant difference in using this new process is it worth the amount of time that it would save so statistically can they tell there's a difference? Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take out our calculators and we're going to type in uh, the original numbers into list one and the modified numbers into list two. Okay, so we're going to just take a second and type in all those numbers. Uh, so 8.6, 5.1, all of that goes into list one. Uh, so if you want to pause the video and go ahead and type the numbers in, and then start it up once you've got uh, the original in list one and the modified in list two. Okay, so now that I got the numbers in, um, let's just take a second and, and have this conversation about whether this, this is a matched pairs test or an independent uh, two sample test. Uh, let's kind of think about what these numbers represent. So they, they've taken a, a picture on a piece of film and they used an original, the original process to develop the film or create the film and they use this modified chemical process that starts working on developing after the picture is taken. Um, a matched pairs test would be like a before and after thing uh, and since I can't take the same picture on the same piece of film and develop it twice that doesn't really apply to this. Um, it makes more sense then that they just did eight pictures of the original and eight pictures of the modified and then that's the data they're sharing with us. So they actually are independent of each other. So it's not that it was 8.6 before and 5.5 after, it's that those are just two groups of two different times um, and it's not they're not really partnered up. It's not like the same picture was developed in 8.6 seconds and then using the other process was 5.5. So it really is a two independent sample t-test.
Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to go to uh, stat and then look for tests. And we want a two sample t test. And this time, instead of stats, I want to go to data. And I just want to tell the calculator where to find the data. And I typed mine in list one, so I'm just going to make sure it says list one. And I typed uh, the modified in list two. Uh, if I had an extra row of numbers that dealt with how often or how frequent certain observations occurred, that would be in uh, frequency one and frequency two, which I don't. Um, as far as directionality goes, um, we're just going to test and see whether there, there's a difference in the process. We're not really saying that one is uh, better than the other, but it would make sense that the modified should be uh, faster, so I can probably put a greater than or, or less than in this, but we'll just do a, a not equal to, and then calculate our p-value. All right, and what do we find? Uh, we have a t-score of 1.52, but more importantly, we have a p-value of 0.151. Uh, so is this significant enough? Uh, is the process fast enough that we can claim there's a difference between the two? And with the most common alpha of 0.05, 15% uh, is not anything to get excited about. So while it might be faster, maybe marginally faster, uh, it's not fast enough that we can say there's an actual difference between how the f two films uh, process the picture. So there is no difference between them.